matter if the murder is hushed up. If you consent to yield his holiness, your fief that lies beyond the Pincian gate. He said you bought perilous impunity with your gold. But if the glory and the interest of the high throne he fills little consist with making it a daily martyr of guilt, as manifold and hideous as the deeds which you scarce hide from men's revolted eyes. The third of my possessions? Let it go. No doubt Pope Clement prays that I long enjoy strength, wealth, and pride, and lust, and length of days, wherein to act the deeds that are the stewards of their revenue. O oh, Count Chenchi, thou mightst honorably live, and reconcile thyself with thine own heart, and with thy God, and with the offended world. How hideous he look deeds of lust and blood through these snow white and venerable hairs. Where is your wife? Where is your gentle daughter? Methink her sweet looks, which make all things else beauteous and glad, might kill the fiend within you. Why is she borrowed from all society but her own strange and uncomplaining wrongs? Talk with me, Count. You know I mean you well. Charged with a thousand unrepented crimes, yet ever have I hoped you would amend, and in that hope have saved your life three times. All oh, men delight in sensual luxury. All men enjoy revenge, and most exult in the tortures they can never feel, flattering their secret peace with the pain of others. But I delight in nothing else, but no remorse and little fear, which are, I think, the checks of other men. Art thou not most miserable? Why miserable? True, I was happier than I am. Well, yet manhood remained to act the thing I thought, while well, lust was sweeter than revenge. Now invention palls. I must all grow old, and but that there remains a deed to act whose horror might make sharp an appetite duller than mine. I do, I know not what. When I was young, I thought only of pleasure and I fed on honey sweets, and I grew tired. Yet, till I killed a foe, and heard his groans, and heard his children's groans, knew I not what delight was else on earth, which now delights me little. I rarely kill the body, which preserves like a strong prison, the soul within my power. Hell's most abandoned fiend did never, in the drunkenness of guilt, speak to his heart as now you speak to me. I thank my God I believe you not. My lord, a gentleman from Salamanca would speak with you. Bid him attend me in the grand saloon. Yes, my lord. Farewell, and I pray, almighty God, that thy false, impious words tempt not his spirit to abandon thee. Yesterday there came an order from the Pope to send fourfold provisions to my accursed sons, whom I had sent from Rome to Salamanca, hoping some accident might cut them off, and meaning, if I could, to starve them there. God, I pray thee, send some quick death upon them. Bernardo and my wife cannot be worse if dead and damned than as the Beatrice. I think they cannot hear me at that door. What if they should? Oh, thou most silent heir, that shalt not hear what now I think. Oh, thou pavement, which I tread towards her chamber. Let your echoes talk my imperious step, scorning surprise, but not of my intent. Andrea! My lord! Bid Beatrice attend me in her chamber this evening. No! At midnight and alone. You heard not truth, Orsino. You remember where we held that conversation. May we see the spot even from the cypress. Two long years are past since on an April midnight, underneath the moonlight ruins of Mount Palatine, I did confess to you my secret mind. 
You said you loved me then. You are a priest. Speak not to me of love. I may obtain the dispensation of the Pope to marry. Because I am a priest, do you believe your image? As the hunter, some struck deer follows me not whether I wake or sleep. As I have said, speak not to me of love. Had you a dispensation, I have not. Nor will I leave this home of misery whilst my poor Bernardo and that gentle lady to whom I owe life and these virtuous thoughts must suffer what I still have strength to share. Ours was a youthful contract, which you first broke by assuming vows no pope will loose. And thus, I love you still, but holily, even as a sister, or a spirit wife. <sighs> Wretched that I am. Where shall I turn? I have a weight of melancholy thoughts, and they forebode... Or what can they forebode worse than I now endure? Well, without not my zeal for only wish, sweet Beatrice, I will use my utmost skill to make sure the Pope attend to your complaint. This night my brother gives a sumptuous feast, Orsino. He has heard some happy news from Salamanca, for my brother's there. And with this outward show of love, he mocks his inward hate. Tis bold hypocrisy, for I know he would gladly celebrate their deaths, which I have heard him pray for on his knees. And all our kin, the Chenchi, will be there, and all the chief nobility of Rome. And he has bidden me and my pale mother attire ourselves in festival array. Poor lady. She expects some happy change in his dark spirit from this act. I none. At supper, I will give you the petition. Till then, farewell. Farewell. I know the Pope will never absolve me of my priestly vow, but by absolving me of a revenue, I will be see. Beatrice, I think to win me at an easier rate. Nor shall he read her own competition. I should be debarred all access. Now as to what she suffers from her father in this, there is much exaggeration. Old men are testy and will have their way. Wives and daughters call this foul tyranny. Yet, I fear her subtle mind, her awe-inspiring gaze whose beams anatomize me nerve by nerve and lay me bare and make me blush to see my hidden thoughts. <laughs> no. A friendless girl who clings to me as to her only hope? I were a fool if she escaped me. Welcome, my friends and kinsmen. An evil word has gone abroad of me, but I do hope that you, my noble friends, when you've shared the entertainment here and heard the pious cause for which it is given, will think me flesh and blood as well as you. Sinful indeed, for Adam made all so, but tender-hearted, meek, and pitiful. In truth, my lord, you seem too light of heart, too spreadedly and companionable that a man to act the deed that rumor pins on you. I never saw such blithe and open cheer in any eye. Some most desired event to which we all demand a common joy has brought us hither. Let us hear it. It is, indeed, a most desired event. When a parent, from a parent's heart, lifts from this earth to the great father of all one supplication, one desire, one hope, that he should grant a wish for his two sons. And suddenly, beyond his dearest hope, it is accomplished, he should rejoice and call his friends and kinsmen to a feast and task their merriment to his love. And honor me thus far, for I am he. Great God, how horrible. Some dreadful ill must have befallen my brothers. Fear not, child, he speaks too frankly. My blood runs cold. God, I thank thee. In one night didst thou perform by ways inscrutable the thing I sought. My disobedient and rebellious sons are dead. Why dead? What means this change of cheer? You hear me not. I tell you, they are dead. They will need no food or raiment more. 
The tapers that did light them their dark way are their last cost. Rejoice with me. Oh, horrible. I will. No, no, stay. I do believe tis some jest, though. Faith, he is mocking us somewhat too solemnly. His son is married the Infanta, or found a mine of gold in El Dorado. Tis but to season some such news. Stay, stay. I see tis only raillery by his smile. Oh, thou bright wine, which leaps and bubbles gaily as my spirits do to hear the death of my accursed sons. Will none among this noble company check the abandoned villain? For God's sakes, you are insane. Let me dismiss the guests. See, silence him. I will. Who moves? Who speaks? <laughs> Tis nothing. Enjoy yourselves. Beware, for my revenge is as the sealed commission of a king that kills, and none dare name the murderer. I do entreat you, go not, noble guests. Shall we therefore find no refuge in this merciless and wide world? Oh, think, I have borne much, and kissed the sacred hand which has crushed us to the earth, I have excused much, doubted, and sought by patience, love, and tears to soften him, until I meet you here, princes and kinsmen. At this hideous feast given at my brother's, at my brother's death, Two yet remain, his wife remains, and I, whom if ye save not, he may soon share such merriment again as fathers make over their children's graves. O oh, Prince Colonna, thou art our near kinsman. Cardinal, thou art the Pope's chamberlain. Camillo, thou art chief justiciar, take us away. I do hope my noble friends will think of their own daughters, or their own throats, before they lend an ear to this insane girl. Dare no one look on me? None answer. Can one tyrant overbear the senses of many wisest men? Oh, that I were buried with my brothers. A bitter wish for one so young and gentle. Can we do nothing? Nothing that I see. Count Chenchi were a dangerous enemy. Yet I would second any one. And I. Retire to your chamber, insolent girl. Retire thou, impious man. Hi. Hide yourself whenever I can look upon thee more. Wouldst thou have honor and obedience, who art a torturer? Father, never dream. Though thou mayst overbear this company, but ill must come of ill. Frown not on me. Haste, hide thyself, lest with avenging looks my brother's ghost should hunt thee from thy seat. My friends, I do lament. This wild girl has ruined the mirth of our festivities. Good night, farewell. I'll no longer make you spectators of our dull domestic quarrels. Another time. My brain is spinning rounds. Give me a bowl of wine. The bacon piper! I know a charm shall make thee meek and tame. Now get thee from my sight! Here, Andrea, fill this goblet with Greek wine. I said I would not drink this evening, but I must. I'm strange to say I feel my spirits fail with what I've decreed to do. Be thou the resolution of quick youth in my veins, and manhood's purpose stern in age's cold, subtle villainy. As if thou wert indeed the blood of my children, which I did thirst to drink. The charm works well. It must be done. It shall be done, I swear it! gentle boy, he struck but me who have borne deeper wrongs. In truth, if he had killed me, 
he had done a kinder deed. Yet weep not, though I love you as my own, I am not your true mother. Oh, more, more than ever mother was to any child that you have been to me. Alas, poor boy, what else couldst thou have done? Did he pass his way? Have you seen him, brother? Oh, no, that is a step of monastery. Just near enough, his hand is on the door. Mother, if I to thee have ever been a duteous child, now save me. I see his face, the door is opening. He frowns on others, but he smiles on me, even as he did after the feast last night. Just what I've seen, sir. Well, what news? My master bids me say the Holy Father has sent back her petition, thus unopened. And he demands at what hour to secure to this room again. At the Ave Maria. So, daughter, our last hope has failed. Ah, me, how pale you look. You tremble and you stand wrapped in some fixed and fearful meditation, as if one thought was overstrong for you. Are you gone mad? If not, pray speak to me. You see, I am not mad. I speak to you. You talked of something your father did after that dreadful feast. Could it be worse than when he smiled and cried, my sons are dead? And whilst you alone stood up and with strong words checked his unnatural pride, and I could see the devil was rebuked that lives in him. Until this hour thus, you have ever stood between us and your father's moody wrath, like a protecting presence. Your firm mind has been our only refuge and defense. What can have thus subdued it? What is it that you say? I was just thinking for better not to struggle anymore. Men, like my father, have been dark and bloody, yet never. Oh, before worse comes of it for wives to die, it ends in that at last. Talk not so, dear child. Tell me at once what did your father do or say to you? Oh, sister, sister, pretty speak to us. It was one word, brother. One little word. And I have never yet despaired, but now. Oh no, just nothing new. The sufferings we all share have made me wild. Alas, I am forgetful of my duty. I should preserve my senses for your sake. Nay, Beatrice, have courage, my sweet girl. If anyone despairs, it should be I, who loved him once and now must live with him, till God in pity call for him or me. For you may, like your sister, find some husband and smile years hence with children round your knees, whilst I, then dead in all this hideous coil, shall be remembered only as a dream. Talk not to me, dear lady, of a husband. Did you not shield me in that dearest boy? And had we any other friend but you in infancy, with gentle words and looks, to win our father not to murder us? May the ghost of my dead mother plead against my soul if I abandon her who filled her place with more even than a mother's love. And then I know my sister's mind. Indeed, I would not leave you in this wretchedness. Oh, never think that I would leave you, mother. Oh, my dear, dear children. What? Beatrice here? Come hither. Nay, hide not your face. Despair. Look up. Why, Nestor Knights, you dared to look with disobedient insolence upon me, bending a stern and inquiring brow on what I meant. Oh, that the earth would gape, hide me, O oh God! Stay, I command you. From this day and hour, never again, I think, with fearless eye and brow superior, an unaltered cheek, and that lip made for tenderness or for scorn, shalt thou strike dumb the meanest of mankind, me least of all. Now get thee to thy chamber. Thou too loathed image of thy cursed mother, thy milky, meek face makes me sick with hate. So much has passed between us as must make me bold and her fearful. Tis an awful thing to touch on such mischief as I now conceive. No, husband, pray forgive poor Beatrice. She meant not any ill. Nor you, perhaps? Nor that young imp whom we've talked by rope parasite with his alphabets? nor Giacomo, nor those two most unnatural sons who stirred enmity up against me with the Pope, whom in one night merciful God cut off. 
<laughs> Innocent lambs. They thought not of you. Were you not here conspiring? Did you not say I would be dungeoned as a madman, or condemned for some offense in which you would be the witnesses? This man, no just it were, the higher assassins, or put sudden poison in my drink. Oh no, you said not this. So help me God, I never thought the things you charged me with. If you dare speak that wicked lie again, I'll kill you. What? It was not by your counsel that Beatrice disturbed the feast last night. You hoped to stir enemies up against me and escape <laughs> and laugh to scorn at what now every nerve of you trembles at. You judge that men are bolder than they are, but few dare stand between their grave and me. Look not so dreadfully. By my salvation, I knew not aught what Beatrice designed, nor do I think she designed anything until she heard you talk of her dead brothers. Blasphemy liar, you are damned for this. But I may take you where you may plead the stones you tread on to deliver you, where there are men but none those who dare all, not question which I command. On Wednesday next, I shall set out. You know, that savage rook, the castle Petrella. Tis safely walled and moated round about, its dungeons underground, and its thick towers never told tales. Why do you linger? Make speediest preparation for the journey. Come, darkness. Yet, what is the day to me? And wherefore should I wish for night, who do a deed that confound both night and day? The act, I think, shall soon extinguish all for me. I walk towards my purpose, secure and unbeheld. Would that it were be done. There is an obsolete and doubtful law by which you may obtain a bare provision of food and clothing. Nothing more. Alas, the eldest son of a rich nobleman has aired all his incapacities. He has wide wants and narrow powers. If you, Cardinal Camille, were reduced at once from thrice driven beds of down and delicate food, an hundred servants and six palaces, to that which nature doth indeed require? Nay, there's reason in your plea. Swear hard. Tis hard for a firm man to bear, but I have a dear wife, a lady of high birth, whose dowry and ill hour I lent my father without a bond or witness to the deed, and children who inherit her fine senses, the fairest creatures of this breeding world, and she and they reproach me not, Cardinal. Do you not think the Pope would interpose and stretch authority beyond the law? Though your peculiar case is hard, I know the Pope will not divert the course of law. You see, after that impious feast the other night, I urged him then to check your father's cruel hand. He frowned and said, Children are disobedient. They sting their father's hearts to madness and despair. And in the great war between the old and the young, I, who have white hair and tottering body, will keep at least blameless neutrality. You, my good Lord Orsino, heard those words. What words? Alas, repeat them not again. Then there is no redress for me. Say, my innocent sister and my only brother are dying under my father's eye. Shall they have no protection? Why, if they would just petition to the Pope, I see not how he could refuse it. Yet he holds it of most dangerous example, and not to weaken the paternal power, being as it were the shadow of his own. I pray you now excuse me. But you, Augustino, have the petition, wherefore not present it? I have presented it, and backed it with my earnest prayers and urgent interests. It was returned unanswered. My friend, that palace walking devil, Gold, has whispered silence to his holiness, and we are left as scorpions ringed with fire. What should we do but strike ourselves to death, or I would? What? Fear not to speak your thought. Words are but holy as the deeds they cover. Ask me not what I think. The unwilling brain feigns often what it would not. And we trust imagination with such fantasies. As the tongue dares fashion into words, which have no words, their horrors make them dim to the mind's eye. But a friend's bosom is in the inmost cave of our own mind. 
where we sit shut from the wide gaze of day, from the all-communicating air, you look what I suspected. I know you are my friend, but my heart is heavy and would take long counsel from the night's sleepless care. Pardon me when I say farewell. 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 Your thoughts better or more bold. I had disposed the Cardinal Camillo to feed his hope with cold encouragement. It fortunately serves my close designs that is a trick of the same family to analyze their own and other minds. Such self-anatomy shall teach the will dangerous secrets, for it tempts our powers. Nor but must be thought, and may be done, into the depth of darkest purposes. Now, what harm if Chenchi should be murdered? And what if I could take the profit, yet admit the sin and peril in such an action? And while Chenchi lives, his daughter's dowry were a secret grave if a priest wins her. Oh, Beatrice, would that I loved thee not! There is no escape! Her bright form kneels beside me at the altar and fills my slumber with tumultuous dreams. From the unraveled hopes of Giacomo, I must piece together my own dear purposes. I see, as from a tower, the end of all. Her father dead, her brother bound to me by a dark secret, surer than the grave. Her mother scared and unexpostulating from the dread manner of her which achieved, and she once more take courage, my faint heart. What tears a friendless maiden match with thee? I have such foresight as assures success. He prospers better, not who becomes an instrument of ill, but he who can flatter the dark spirit that makes his empire and its prey of other hearts, to become his slave, as I will do. must be what blind me so, and yet I tied it fast. Oh, horrible! The pavement sinks beneath my feet, the walls spin round. Your creeps, the clean, black, contaminating mist about me, to substantial, heavy, thick. I cannot pluck it from me, for it, it glues my fingers and limbs to one another and eats into my sinews, and dissolves my flesh to a pollution, poisoning. A subtle, pure, and inmost spirit of life. I'm mad beyond all doubt. No! No, I'm dead. These putrefying limbs shut round and settled for the panting soul which would burst forth into the wandering air. What hideous thought was that I had even now? Tis gone. And yet its burden remains here, over these dull eyes, upon this weary heart. What ails thee, child? She answers not. Her spirit apprehends a sense of pain, but not its cause. Suffering has dried away the only source from which it sprung. Like a parasite, misery has killed its father. And yet its father never liked mine. Oh God, what thing am I? My dearest child, what has your father done? Who art thou, questioner? I have no father. She is the madhouse nurse who tends on me. It is a piteous office. Did you know? I thought I was that wretched Beatrice men speak of. Whom her father sometimes hails from hall to hall by the entangled hair. This woeful story, 
So did I overact in my sick dreams that I imagined. No, 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 it cannot be. Horrible things have been in this wild world, but never fancy image such a deed as. Who art thou? Swear to me, ere I die with fearful expectation that indeed thou art not what thou seemest. Mother, my sweet child, know you. Yet speak it not. For if this be a truth, that other too must be a truth. I have talked some wild words, but will no more. Mother, come near me. From this point in time, I am my dear child. What has befallen thee? What has your father done? What have I done? Is it my crime? That one with white hair and imperious brow, who tortured me from my forgotten days as parents only dare, should call himself my father, and yet should be. What am I? What name, what place, what memory shall be mine? He is a violent tyrant, truly, child. We know that death alone can make us free. His death or ours. But what can you have done of deadlier outrage or worse injury? Thou art unlike thyself. Speak to me. If I try to speak, I shall go mad. Ay, something must be done. What yet I know not. Something which shall make the thing which I have suffered. But a shadow and the dread lightning which avenges it. When I know what, I shall be still and calm. But now, oh, blood which art my father's blood circling through these contaminated veins. If thou pour forth upon this polluted earth could wash away the crime and punishment by which I suffer. No, it cannot be. It must indeed have been some bitter wrong. Yet what? I dare not guess. Oh, my lost child, I am not in proud and penetrable grief. Thy sufferings from my fear. I hide them not. What are the words that you would have me say? I who can feign no image in my mind of that which has transformed me. I whose thought is like a ghost, shrouded and folded up in its own formless horror, for there is none to tell my misery. If another ever knew aught like to it, she died, as I will die, and left it as I must without a name. Death, death. Our law and our religion call thee a punishment and a reward. Oh, which have I deserved? The peace of innocence. For in your season you be called to heaven. Whatever you may have suffered, you have done no evil. Death must be the punishment of crime, or the word of trampling down the thorns in which God has strewn upon the path which leads to immortality. Hi, death, the punishment of crime. I pray thee, God, let me not be bewildered while I judge. Self-murder? No, that might be no escape. For thy decree yawns like a hell between our will and it. In this mortal world, there is no vindication and no law which can adjudge and execute the doom of that through which I suffer. Welcome, friend. I have to tell you that since we last met, I have endured a wrong so great and strange that neither life nor death will give me rest. Ask not what it is. For there are deeds which have no form, sufferings which have no tongue. What is he who has thus injured you? The man they call my father, a dread name. It cannot be. What it can be or not, forbear to think. It is and it has been. Advise me how it shall not be again. I thought to die, but a religious awe restrains me. And the dread, lest death itself might be no refuge. Oh, speak. Accuse him of the deed, and will the law avenge thee? Oh, ice hearted counselor. If I could find a word that would make known the crime of my destroyer, I lay all bare so that my unpolluted fame should be by vilest gossips a stale mouth of story, a mock, a byword, an astonishment. If this were done, which shall never be done, think of the offender's goal, his dreaded hate and the strange horror of the accuser's tale. Baffling belief, overpowering speech, scarce whispered, unimaginable, wrapped in hideous hints, oh, most assured redress. You will endure it then? Endure it. 
Orsino, it seems your counsel is small profit. I all must suddenly be resolved and done. What is this indistinguishable mist of thought which rises like shadow after shadow, darkening each other? Should the offender live, triumph in his misdeed, and make by use his crime whate'er it is dreadful, no doubt, thine element, until thou mayest become utterly lost, subdued even to the hue of that which thou permittest? Mighty death, thou double-visaged shadow, only judge, rightfulest arbiter, the lightning of God has ever descended to us. Blaspheme not! His high providence commits its glory on this earth, and their own wrongs into the hands of men. But if one, like this wretch, should mock with gold opinion, law and power, if, because our wrongs, for that they are unnatural, strange, and monstrous, exceed all measure of belief, O oh God, and we, the victims, bear worse punishment than that appointed for their torturers? Think not, but that there is redress where there is wrong, so we be bold enough to seize it. How? There is a way to make all sure, I know not, but I think it might be good to- Why, his late outrage to Beatrice, for it is as such as I can but faintly guess as makes remorse dishonor and leaves her but one duty, how she may avenge. You, but one refuge from ills ill endured me, but one counsel- For we cannot hope, for aid or retribution or resource will arise thence, when every other one will find them with less need. And peace, Orsino. And honored lady, while I speak, I pray that you put aside, like garments overworn, remorse and fear, forbearance and respect, and all the other fit restraints of daily life, which would now be a mockery to my holier plea. As I have said, I have endured a wrong, which though it be expressionless, is such as asks atonement. I have prayed to God, and I have talked with my own heart, and have at last determined what is right. Art thou my friend, Orsino, false or true? Pledge thy salvation ere I speak. I swear to dedicate my cunning, my strength, my silence, and whatever else is mine to thy commands. You think we should devise his death and execute what is devised, and suddenly we must be brief and bold. And yet most cautious. The jealous laws would punish us with death and infamy for that which it became themselves to do. Be cautious as ye may, but prompt. Orsino, what are the means? I know two dull, fierce outlaws, who think a man's spirit is a worm's. They sell what we now want. Tomorrow, before dawn, Chenchi will take us to that lonely rock Petrella. If he should arrive there- He must not arrive. Will it be dark before you reach the tower? The sun will scarce be set, but I remember two miles down this side of the fort, the road crosses a deep ravine. At noonday here tis twilight, and at sunset, blackest night. Make some excuse for loitering at the bridge until- What, what sound is that? Hark! No, it cannot be a servant's step. And must be Chenchi unexpectedly return. Make some excuse for being here. That step we hear approach must never cross the bridge of that ravine. What shall I do? Chenchi must find me here, and I must bear the imperious inquisition of his looks as to what brought me hither. No, let me mask mine own and summon name and vacant smile. How? Have you ventured hither, knowing that Chenchi is from home? I saw him here, and I must wait till he returns. Great God, weigh you the danger of this rashness? Aye. Does my destroyer know his danger? We are now as once no more, parent and child, but man to man, oppressor to be oppressed, slanderer to be slandered, foe to foe. He has cast nature off, and nature was his shield. And nature cast him off, and he is her shame. And I spurn both. Be calm, dear friend. Well, I will calmly tell you what he did. The old Francesco Cenci, as you know, borrowed the dowry of my wife from me, and then denied the loan, leaving me so in poverty. When he came to upbraid and curse, I spoke to him of my wife's dowry. He coined a brief yet specious tale how I had wasted the sum in secret right. And when I knew the impression he had made, and felt my wife insult with silent scorn, my advent troop a look adverse and cold. My children cried, Father, give us better clothes, give us better food. What you in one night squandered was enough for months. 
And I looked and saw that home was hell, and to hell I return no more, until mine enemy has rendered up, or atonement, has gave life to me, I will, reversing nature's Trust law. me, the compensation which thou seekest here will be denied. Then, are you not my friend? Did you not hint at the alternative the other day when we conversed? What you devise is, as it were, accomplished. Is he dead? His grave is ready. Know that since we last met, Chen, she has done an outrage to his daughter. What outrage? That she speaks not, but you may conceive such half-conjectures as I do, from her fixed paleness, from the lofty grief of her stern brow bent on idle air, and her severe, unmodulated voice. And last from this, that whilst her stepmother and I, bewildered in our horror, talked together, she interrupted us, and with a look which told before she spoke it, he must die. That is enough. My doubts are well appeased. There is a higher reason for the act than mine. There is a holier judge than me, a more unblamed avenger. Beatrice, my fair sister, is there made ravage of thee? O oh, heart, I ask no more justification. Shall I wait or see no till he comes and stab him at the door? Not so. Some accident might interpose to rescue him from what is now most sure. And you are unprovided where to fly or how to conceal. Nay, listen. All is contrived. Success is so sure that this is my brother's voice. Oh, my sister, my fair sister. Oh. I see Gorsino has talked with you, and that you conjecture things too horrible to speak, and yet far less than the truth. Now stay not, he might return. Yet kiss me. I shall know then that you have consented to his death. Farewell. Farewell. Answer not. Farewell. even now, perhaps, the life that kindled mine. It is the form that molded mine that sinks into the white and yellow spasms of death. One, two, the hours crawl on. I almost wish he be not dead. My wrongs are great, yet tis your seen of step. Speak! I'm come to say that Chechi has escaped. Escaped? And safe within Petrella. He oh. passed by the spot an hour, pointed for the deed an hour too soon. Are we fools of such contingencies? And do we waste in blind misgivings thus the hours when we should act? I henceforth will ne'er aught repent, designed or done but my repentance. Why, what need of this? Who feared the pale intrusion of remorse in the just deed? Doubt not, while our first plan failed, he will soon be laid to rest. Yes, here, we see the lamp. Let's not talk in the dark. Well, once quenched, I cannot thus relieve my father's life. Do you not think his ghost might plead that argument with God? Once gone, we cannot now recall your sister's loss of peace, your own extinguished years of youth and hope. Nor your wife's bitter words, nor your dead mother, nor your children's cries, nor those who mock you even now from ramparts broad as you come hither. Oh, speak no more. I am resolved. Listen. You know, Olympio, the Castellan of Petrella, him whom your father degraded from his post? And Marcio, that desperate wretch, whom your father deprived of a reward of blood well earned and due? I know of Olympio, and they say he hated my father, so that, in his silent rage, his, white, his lips grew white to see him pass. Of Marzio, I know not. Marzio's hate matches Olympio's. I have sent these men, but in your name and as at your request, to talk with Beatrice and Lucretia. 
only to talk. The moments which pass even now, tomorrow's midnight hour, may memorize their flight of death. Ere then they must have talked, and they perhaps have done. Listen, what sound is that? The beams crack, no else. It is my wife complaining in her sleep. I doubt not she is saying bitter things of me, and my children round her dreaming I deny them sustenance. Whilst he who truly took it from her, and who fills their hungry rest with bitterness, now sleeps. If ere he wakes again, I will not henceforth to hireling hands. Why, that were well. I must be gone. Good night. We next meet. May all be done. And all forgotten. Oh, that I had ever been. She comes not, yet even now I have left her vanquished and faint. She knows the penalty of her delay, yet what if threats are in vain? Not now within Petrella's moat, why do not drag her by the golden hair, stamp on her, keep her sleepless till her brain be overworn, tame her with chains and famine, lest would suffice, it so would leave undone what I most seek. No, tis her stubborn will, which by its own consent shall stoop as low as that which drags it down. The loathed wretch, hide thee from my boards. Yet stay! Bid Beatrice come hither. O oh, husband, I pray for thine own wretched sake, heed what thou dost. A man who walks through his crimes like thee, and through the dangers of his crimes, each hour may stumble over a sudden grave. And thou art old, thy hairs are hoary gray. If thou wouldst save thyself from death and hell, pity thy daughter. Give her to some friend in marriage, so she may tempt thee not to hatred, or worse thoughts, if worse there be. What? Like her sister, who has found a home to mock my hate from with prosperity? Strange ruin shall befall her and thee and all that yet remain. Now go, bid her come, before my mood be changed, lest I should drag her by the hair. She sent me to thee, husband, and at thy presence she fell, as thou dost know, into a trance. And in this trance she heard a voice that said, Chen Chi must die, let him confess himself. Even now the accusing angel waits to see if God, to punish his enormous crimes, harden his dying heart. Why, such things are. No doubt divine revealings may be made. Well, well, I must give up the greater point, which was to poison and corrupt her soul. One, two, Beatrice shall, if there be any skill in hate, die blaspheming to Bernardo. <laughs> he is so innocent. I bequeath the memory of these deeds and turn his youth into the sepulchre of hope, where evil thoughts may grow like weeds on a neglected doom. Yet, lest death outspeed my purpose, let me make short work and sure. Oh, stay! It was a faint. She had no vision and she heard no voice. I, I said that but to awe thee. That is well, vile poulture of the sacred ah! truth of God. Be thy soul choked with that blasphemy lie. For Beatrice, there are worse terrors in store to bend her to my will. Ah! What cruel sufferings! More than she has known, can thou inflict? Andrea, go call my daughter, and if she comes not, tell her that I come. What sufferings? I shall drag her, step by step, through infamies unheard of among men. She <laughs> shall stand shelterless in the broad noon of public scorn, for acts blazoned abroad, 
one among which shall be. <laughs> what? Canst thou guess? And when dead, her corpse shall be abandoned to the hounds. Her name shall be the terror of the earth. She shall approach the throne of God, plague spotted with my curses. I shall make body and soul a monstrous lump of ruin. The lady what? Is... Speak, pale slave. Go tell my father that I see the gulf of hell between us two, which he may pass. I will not. Go thou quick, Lucretia. Bid her come. Yet let her understand, her coming is her consent. And if she comes not, I will curse her. Well, what? Speak, wretch. She said, I cannot come. Go tell my father, I see a torrent of his own blood raging between us. God, hear me. Earth, in the name of God, let her food be poison, until she's encrusted round with leprous stains. Parch up those loving, kindled lips, warp those fine limbs to loathed lameness. For thy own sake, and say such dreadful words, God punishes such prayers. He does his will, I do mine! In addition, that if she have a child, Horrible that if she ever have a child, may it be a hideous likeness of herself, as if from a distorted mirror she sees her image mixed with that that she most abhors, and that day by day from its infancy may it grow more wicked and deformed, turning her mother's love to misery. Shall I revoke this curse? Then bid her come before my words be chronicled in heaven. <laughs> I do not feel as if I were a man, but a fiend appointed to chastise the offenses of some unremembered world. The blood runs up and down my veins, a fearful pleasure making it prick and tingle. Well, what? She bids thee curse, and as thy curses as they cannot do could kill her soul. She would not come. Tis well. I can do both. First take what I demand, and then extort concession. To thy chamber, fly ere I spurn thee. Tis safer to come between a tiger and his prey. Must be late. My eyes grow a weary dim with unaccustomed heaviness of sleep. Conscience! I will first go by thee with an hour of rest. It will be deep and calm. They come not yet. Tis scarce midnight, how slow legs leaden footed time. The minutes pass. If he should wake before the deed is done, oh mother, he must never wake again. What thou hast said persuade him that our act will but dislodge a spirit of deep hell out of a human form. Tis true, he spoke of death and judgment with strange confidence for one so wicked. And yet, to die without confession? Believe that heaven is merciful and just, and will not add our dread necessity to the amount of his offenses. See? They come. All mortal things must hasten thus to their dark end. Let us go down. How feel you to this work? As one who thinks a thousand crowns an excellent market price for an old murderer's life, your cheeks are pale. Tis a pale reflection of your own, which call you pale, 
Is that their natural hue? Or tis my hate, and the deferred desire to wreck it, which extinguishes their blood. You are inclined then to this business. Aye. If one should bribe me with a thousand crowns to kill the servant that had stung my child, I could not be more willing. Noble ladies, are you resolved? Is he asleep? Is all quiet? I mixed an opiate with his drink. He sleeps so sound, but ye are resolved. You know it is a high and holy deed. We're resolved. As to this task be warranted, it rests with you. Well, follow. Hush! Hark! What noise is that? As someone comes. Ye conscience stricken cravens, rock to rest your baby hearts. It is the iron gate, which you left open, swinging in the wind. <coughs> Come, follow, and be your steps like a <coughs> Light, quick, and bold. They are about it now. Nay, to stop. I have not heard him groan. He will not groan. What sound is that? Just to try to feed about his bed. My God, if he now be a cold, stiff corpse. Oh, fear not what may be done, but what is left undone. Is it accomplished? What? I ask if all is over. <laughs> we dare not kill an old sleeping man. His thin gray hair, his stern and reverent brow, his veined hands crossed over his heaving breast, and the calm sleep in which he lay quelled me. Indeed, indeed, I cannot do it. But I was bolder, for I chewed Olympio and bade him bear his wrongs to his own grave and leave me the reward. And so my knife slid upon that loose and wrinkled throat when he stood in his sleep and spoke. And I knew it was the ghost of my dead father speaking through his lips, and I could not kill him. Miserable slaves! Where, if ye dare not kill a sleeping man, found ye the boldness to return to me with such a deed undone? Base palterers, cowards and traitors, why do I talk? Hadst thou a tongue to say she murdered her own father, I must do it. Stop, for God's sake. I will go back and kill him. Give me the weapon. Must do thy will. Take it. Depart. Return. Oh, how pale thou art. We do, but that which were a deadly crime to leave undone. Oh, would it were done. Even as that doubt is passing through your mind, the world is conscious of a change. Darkness and hell have swallowed up the vapor they sent forth to blacken the sweet light of life. My breath comes, methinks, lighter, and my jelly blood runs freely through my veins. Hark! He is dead. We strangled him that there might be no blood, and threw his stiff corpse over the balcony into the garden. Twill seem it fell. Here, take this gold and hasten to your homes. And Marzio, because thou wast only awed by that which made me tremble, wear thou this. It was the mantle my great-grandfather wore in his high prosperity. Live. Thou wert a weapon in the hand of God to a just use. Live long and thrive. And mark, if thou hast any crime, repent. This deed is not. Hark, tis the castle horn. My God, it sounds like the last trump. Some tedious guest is arriving. The drawbridge is let down. There is a tramp of horses in the court. Fly, hide yourselves. Let us retire to counterfeit the Christ. I hardly need to counterfeit it now. The spirit which doth reign within these limbs seems strangely undisturbed. All ill is surely past. <clears throat> Lady? My duty to his holiness be my excuse, that thus unseasonably I break upon your rest. I must speak with Count Trenton. Doth he sleep? I think he sleeps, yet wake him not, I pray spare me a while. He is a wicked and wrathful man. If he should be roused from his sleep tonight, which is, I know, a hell of angry dreams, it were not well. Wait till daybreak. Oh, I am deadly sick. I grieve thus to distress you, but the Count must answer to charges of the gravest import, and suddenly, such my commission is. I dare not rouse him. I know none who dare. To perilous, you might have safely waken a serpent, or a corpse in which some fiend were laid to sleep. Lady, my moments here are counted. I must rouse him, if since none else dare. Oh, agony. Oh, despair. Bernardo, conduct you to Lord Leggett to your father's chambers. Tis a 
messenger come to arrest the culprit? Both earth and heaven, consenting arbiters, acquit our deed. Oh, agony of fear, would that he might yet still live. Even now I heard Lord Leggett's followers whispering as they passed. They had a warrant for his instant death. All was prepared by unforbidden means, which we must pay so dearly having done. Even now they search the tower and find the body. Now they suspect the truth, and they consult before they come to tax us with the fact. Oh, horrible! Tis all discovered! Mother, what is done wisely is done well. Be bold. Tis like a truant child to fear that others know what thou hast done. And thus write on unsteady eyes and altered cheek all thou wouldst hide. Be faithful to thyself, and fear no other witness but thy fear. The deed is done. I am as universal as the light, as free as the earth's surrounding air, as firm as the word world's center. Consequence to me is as the wind which strikes the solid rook, but shakes it not. Murder! 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 Sound the alarms. Look to the gates that none escape. What now? I know not what to say. My father's dead. How dead? You mistake, brother. He only sleeps. His sleep is very calm, very like death. He is not dead. Dead. Uh, murdered. Oh, no, no. He is not murdered, though he may be dead. I have alone the keys to those apartments. Ha! Huh. Is it so? My lord, I pray excuse us. We shall retire. My mother is not well. She seems quite overcome by this strange horror. <laughs> Can you suspect who may have murdered him? I know not what to think. Can you name any who had interest in his death? Alas, I can name none who had not. <laughs> and, and those most who most lament that such a deed is done, my mother, my sister, and myself. Tis strange. There were clear marks of violence. I found the old man's body in the moonlight, hanging beneath the window of his chamber in the branches of a pine. But he could not have fallen there, for his limbs lay heaped and effortless. Favor me, sir, and tell the ladies I request their presence. We have one. My lord, we found this ruffian and another lurking among the rocks. There is no doubt but that they are the murderers of Count Chinch. Each had a bag of coin on it, and this one wore a golden woven robe, which, shining brightly, betrayed them to our notice. <laughs> the other fell, desperately fighting. What does he confess? Keeps firm silence, my lord, but these lines found on him may speak. Their language is at least sincere. To the Lady Beatrice, that the atonement of what my nature sickens to conjecture may soon arrive, I send thee, at thy brother's desire, those who will speak and do more than I dare write, the devoted servant, Orsino. Knowest thou this writing, lady? No. <laughs> Nor thou? Where was it found? What is it? It should be Orsino's hand. It speaks of that strange horror which never yet found utterance, but which made between that hapless child and her dead father a gulf of obscure hatred. Is it true that thy father did such outrages as to awaken in thee unfilial hate? Not hate. It was more than hate. This is most true, yet wherefore question me? There is a deed demanding question done. Thou hast a secret which will answer not. What sayest? My lord, your words are bold and rash. I do arrest all present in the name of the Count, the Pope's Holiness. You must to Rome. Oh, not to Rome. Indeed, we are not guilty. Guilty? Who dares talk of guilt? My lord, I am more innocent of parricide than is a child born fatherless. Dear lady, your gentleness and patience are no shield for this keen judging world. That wretch, who stands so pale and trembling and amazed, if it be true he murdered Chenchi, was a sword in the right hand of justice God. Wherefore should I have wielded it? Do you own that you desired his death? Tis true. I did believe and hope and pray. I even knew, for God is wise and just, that some strange death hung over him. Tis true there was no other rest for me on earth, no other hope in heaven. Now what of this? 
Strange thoughts beget strange deeds, I judge thee not. And yet if you arrest me, you are the judge and executioner of that which is the life of life. Tis most false I am guilty of foul parricide, although I must rejoice and for justice cause that other hands have sent my father's soul to ask the mercy he denied to me. Now leave us free, stay not a noble house. I dare not, Libby. I pray that you prepare yourselves for Rome. There the Pope's further pleasures will be known. Not to Rome. Take us not to Rome. Why not to Rome, dear lady? <coughs> there as here, our innocence is as armed heel, trampling accusation. Cheer up, lean on me and collect your wandering thoughts. We shall be ready. Mother, will you come? <sighs> they will bind us to the rack and wrest self-accusation from our agony. Will Giacomo be there? Orsino? Marzio? All present, all confronted, all demanding each from the other's countenance the thing which is in every heart. Oh, misery. She faints, an ill appearance this. My lord, she fears that power is a snake whose look transmutes all things to guilt, which is its nutriment. Our suite will join yours in the court below. Thus quickly come to an end. Alas, alas, it was a wicked thought, a piteous deed to kill an old and hoary headed father. It has turned out, unluckily, in truth, to violate the sacred doors of sleep, to cheat kind nature of the placid death which she protects from over wearied age, to drag from heaven an unrepentant soul which might have quenched in reconciling prayers, a life of burning cries. You cannot say I urged you to the deed. Oh, had I ever found in thy smooth and ready countenance the mirror of my darkest thoughts? Hadst thou with hints and questions made me look upon the monstrous of my mind until it grew familiar to desire? Tis thus. Men cast the blame of their unprosperous acts upon the abettors of their own resolve, or anything but their weak, guilty selves. Yet, confess the truth. It is the peril in which you stand which gives you this pale sickness of penitence. What if yet we were safe? How can that be? Already Beatrice, Lucretia, and the murderer are in prison. I doubt not. Whilst we speak, officers are sent to arrest us. I am all prepared for instant flight. We can escape even now, so we take fleet occasion by the hand. Oh, oh, rather expire in tortures as I may. What? Will you cast self-accused flight assured conviction upon Beatrice? She who stands alone in this unnatural work stands like God's angel ministered upon by fiends, naming such an avengeless wrong as that parasite turns to piety, whilst we for basis ends. I fear, Orsino, that whilst I consider your words and looks, comparing them with your proposal now, that you must be a villain. Thou art no liar, thou art a lie, traitor and murderer, coward and slave, but no, defend thyself! Put up your weapon. <laughs> Is it the desperation of your fear makes you thus rash and sudden with a friend, now ruined for your sake? If honest anger have moved you, know that what I proposed was but to try you. As for me, I think thankless affection led me to this point. <laughs> From this my firm temper that repents, I cannot now receive. Now, if there were any words of melancholy comfort you wish to speak to your pale wife, it were best to pass out of the postern and avoid them so. Oh, generous friend, how canst thou pardon me? Would that my life could purchase thine? That wish now comes a day too late. Haste, fare thee well. Here's the on steps along the corridor. <laughs> I'm sorry for it, but the guards are waiting at this gate. And such was my contrivance, that I might rid me of him and them. <laughs> if 
thought to act a solemn comedy upon the painted scene of this new world, there arose a power which grasped and snapped the threads of my device and turned it to a net of ruin. Orsina! Yes. Is that my name in your proclaimed abroad? But I will pass, wrapped in a vile disguise, rags on my back and a false innocence on my face through the misdeeming crowd which judges by what seems. I fear what is past shall never let me rest. Where shall I find the disguise to hide me from myself? As now I skulk from every other eye. Accused. Do you persist in your denial? I demand who are the participators in your offense. Speak the truth, the whole truth. My God, I did not kill him. I know nothing. Olympio sold the robe to me from which you'd infer my guilt. Dare you, with lips yet white from the rack's kiss, speak false? Is it so soft a questioner that you would bandy lovers talk with it till it wind away your life and soul? Away. Oh, spare me, spare. I will confess. Then speak. I strangled him in his sleep. Who urged you to it? His own son Giacomo and the young prelate Orsino sent me to Petrella. There the ladies Beatrice and Lucretia tempted me with a thousand crowns, and I and my companion forthwith murdered him. Now let me die. This sounds as bad as truth. Guards, bring in the other prisoners. There. Look upon this man. When did you see him last? We never saw him. You know me too well, Lady Beatrice. I know thee. How? Where? When? You know, t'was I who you did urge with menaces and bribes to kill your father. When the deed was done, you clothed me in a robe of woven gold and bade me thrive. How I have thriven, you see. You, my lord Giacomo, Lady Lucretia, you know what I speak is truth. Oh, turn those eyes away from me, they burn. That stern yet piteous look wounds worse than torture. My lords, take me, take me away. Poor wretch, I pity thee, yet stay a while. Guards, lead him near the Lady Beatrice. See, he shrinks from her. Cardinal Camillo, thou hast a good repute for gentleness and wisdom. Can it be that you sit here to countenance a wicked farce like this? When some obscure and trembling slave is dragged from tortures which might shake the sternest heart, and begged to answer not as he believes, but as those may suspect or do desire, whose questions then suggest their own reply, and that in the peril of such hideous tortures that merciful God spares even the damned. Speak now the thing you surely know, which is that you, if your fine frame were stretched upon that wheel, and you were told, confess that you did poison your little nephew, that fair blue-eyed child, who was the lodestar of your life, yet you would say, I confess to anything, and beg from your tormentors, like that slave, the refuge of dishonorable death. I pray thee, Cardinal, that thou assert my innocence. What shall we think, my lords? Shame on these tears. I pledge my soul that she is guiltless. And yet she must be tortured. I would have soon tortured my own nephew. She is as pure as speechless infancy. Well, be her purity on your head, my lord, if you forbid the rack. His holiness has enjoined us to pursue this crime by the severest forms of punishment, nay, even to stretch a point against the criminals. Now the prisoners stand accused of parasite upon such evidence as justifies torture. What evidence? This man's? Even so. Come near. And who art thou, thus chosen forth among the multitude of living men to kill the innocent? I am Marcio, thy father's vassal. Fix thine eyes on mine. Answer to what I ask. He dares not look the thing he speaks, but bends his gaze in the blind earth. What? Wilt thou say that I did murder my own father? Oh, spare me! Speak to me no more, those... This... Oh, take me away and let her not look on me. I am a guilty, miserable wretch. I have said all I know. Now let me die. My lords, if by my nature I have been so stern as to have planned the crime alleged, which your suspicions dicta dictate to this man, and which the rock makes him utter, do you think I should have left this two-edged instrument of my misdeed? This man, this bloody knife with my own name engraven on the heft, left unsheathed for my own death? 
But what is this poor life? What are a thousand lives? A parasite had trampled them like dust. And see, he lives. And thou, O oh, spare! Thou stern yet piteous look wounds worse than torture. My lord, having said this, let me be led to death. Guards, lead him not away. O oh, thou who tremblest on the giddy verge of life and death, pause ere thou answerest me. Brush not before thy judge, and say, My maker, I have done this and more. For there was one who was most pure and innocent on earth, and because she endured what never any guilty or innocent endured before, and because her wrongs could not be told, nor thought, and because thy hand at length did rescue her, I with my words killed her and all her kin. Think of what it is to blot with blood and infamy all that shows like innocence, and is, hear me, great God, I swear most innocent. Am I or am I not a parasite? Thou wert not. Ooh. What is this? My lord, I here declare that those whom I did accuse are innocent. Tis I alone am guilty. Oh. Take him away to torments, and bind him not till he confess. Torture me as you will, a keener pang has run a higher truth for my last trap. She is most innocent. Bloodhounds not men, gut yourselves well with me. I will not give you that fine piece of nature to rend and ruin. What say ye now, my lord? Let the torture strain the truth, till it be white as snow thrice sifted by the frozen wind. Yet stained with blood. Know you this paper, lady? Interrupt me not with questions. Who stands here as my accuser? Here is Orsino's name. Where is Orsino? Let his eye meet mine. What means this scroll? Alas, ye know not what. And thus on the chance that it might be some evil, will he kill us? Orsino's dead. Well, what did he say? Nothing. As soon as we had him bound on the wheel, he smiled on us, as one who baffles a deep adversary, and holding his breath, died. <laughs> there remains nothing but to apply the question to those prisoners who yet remain stubborn. I overrule further proceedings, and in behalf of these most innocent and noble persons, will use my interest with the Holy Father. Let the Pope's pleasure then be done. Meanwhile, conduct each of these culprits to separate cells, and be the engines ready for this night, if the Pope's resolution be grave, pious, and just as once, I'll wring the truth out of those nerves and sinews, groan by groan. How gently slumber rests upon her face, like the last thoughts of some day sweetly spent, holding in nights and dreams, and so prolonged. After such torments she bore last night, how, how light and soft her breathing comes. I me, methinks I shall never sleep again. But I must shake the heavenly dew of rest from this sweet folded flower. Thus, wake, awake. What, sister, can't still sleep? I was just dreaming that we were all in paradise. This cell seems like a kind of paradise after our father's presence. Oh, dear, dear sister, would that that dream were not a dream? Oh, God, how shall I tell? What wouldst thou tell, sweet brother? Look not so calm and happy whilst I stand, considering what I have to say. My heart will break. See, now thou makest me weep. How very friendless thou would be, dear child, if I were dead. Say what thou hast to say. They have confessed. They could endure no more the torture. What was there to confess? In noble hearts, for some brief spasms of pain, which are at least as mortal as the limbs through which they pass, are centuries of high splendor laid in dust? O oh, thou who wert a mother to the perilous, kill not thy child, let not her wrongs kill thee. Brother, lay down with me upon the rack, 
and let us each be as silent as a corpse. It shall soon be as soft as any grave. Tis the falsehood that it brings from fear makes the rock cruel. They will tear the truth away from thee at last. Those cruel pains say thou art guilty now for pity's sake. Oh, speak the truth. Let us all quickly die. And after death, God is our judge, not they. He will have mercy on us. If indeed it can be true, say so, dear sister mine. And then the Pope will surely pardon you and all of you well. Confess, or I will warp your limbs with such keen tortures. Tortures? Turn the rack henceforth into a spinning wheel. My pangs are of the mind and of the heart. With considering all the wretched life that I have lived, and its now wretched end, and the small justice shown by heaven and earth to me or mine. And what a tyrant thou art, and what slaves these, and what a world we make, the oppressor and the oppressed. Such pangs compel my answer. What is it thou wouldst with me? Art thou not guilty of thy father's death? Or wilt thy rather tax high judging God, that he permitted such an act as that which I have suffered in which he beheld? Made it unutterable, and took from it all refuge, all revenge, all consequence. Say what you will, I shall deny no more. If ye desire it thus, thus let it be, and so an end of all. Now do your will. No other pains shall force another word. She is convicted, but has not confessed. Be it enough. Until their final sentence, let none have conversed with them. You, young lord, linger not here. Oh, tear him not away. Oh, guard, I will do my duty. Would ye divide body from soul? That is the headsman's business. <laughs> Have I confess to have killed my father and betrayed my sister? I be the only thing pure and innocent in this world, my little ones, my wife. Helpless and I, God, Father, can even the unforgivable be forgive? Can our full hearts break thus, thus? A child. What a dreadful end do we all come. Why did I yield? Why did I not sustain those torments? Oh, that I were all dissolved into these fast and unavailing tears which flow and feel not. What was weak to do? Tis weaker to lament one's being done. Take cheer. The God which knew my wrongs, and which made our speedy act the angel of his wrath, seems, and but seems, to have abandoned us. Let us not think that we shall die for this. Brother, sit near me. Give me your firm hand. You had a manly heart. Bear up. Dearest lady, put your head upon my shoulder and try to sleep a while. Your eyes look pale, hollow, and overworn with the heaviness of watching and slow grief. Come, I shall sing you some low and sleepy tune, so that will do. Have I forgotten the words? Faith, they are sadder than I remember. Sweet sleep, were dead light to thee. Or if thou couldst mortal be, I would close these eyes of pain. When to wake, never again. Oh, world. Farewell, listen to the passing bell. It says thou and I must part with a light and heavy heart. The 
Pope is stern, not to be moved or bent. He said these three words coldly, they must die. And yet you left him not? I urged him still, pleading as I could guess, the devilish wrong which prompted your unnatural parent's death. He replied, Parricide grows so ripe that soon, for some just cause, no doubt, the young will strangle us all, dozing in our chairs. Authority and power and hoary hair are grown crime's capital. You are my nephew. You come to ask their pardon. Stay a moment. Here is their sentence. Never see me more till to the letter be all fulfilled. Oh God, not so. Oh, there are words and looks to bend the sternest purpose. Once I knew them, now I forget them at my dearest need. What, what think you if I seek him out and bathe his feet and robe with hot and bitter tears? Importune him with my prayers, vexing his brain with my perpetual cries until, until in his rage he strike me with his pastoral cross and trample my prostrate head until my blood stains the senseless dust upon which he treads and remorse wake in mercy. Oh, I will do it. Oh, wait till I return! Alas, poor boy, erect, devoted seaman, thus my prey to the deaf sea. I hardly dare to fear that thou bringst other news than a just pardon. May God in heaven be less inexorable to the Pope's prayers as, as he's been to mine. Here is the sentence and the warrant. Oh my God. Can it be that I have to die so suddenly? So young. To go under the obscure. Cold. Rotting and wormy ground. How fearful. To be nothing. Or to be. What? Oh, let me not go mad. Sweet heaven, forgive weak thoughts. If there should be no God, no heaven, no earth in this void world, the wide, gray, lampless, deep and unpeopled world, if all things then should be, my father's spirit, his eye, his voice, his touch surrounding me, the atmosphere and breath of my dead life, if even as a shape, more like himself, even the form which tortured me on earth, massed in gray hairs and wrinkles, he should come and wind his hellish arms around me and fix his eyes on mine and drag me down, down, down. For was he alone not omnipotent on earth and ever present? Child, trust in God's sweet love and the tender promises of Christ, fair night. I think we shall be in paradise. Yes, past. No, whatever no. comes, my heart shall sink no more. And yet I know not why your words strike chill. How tedious, cold, and false seem all things. I have met with much injustice in this world. No difference has been made by God or man or any other power molding my wretched lot. Whether good or evil, as regarded me. I am cut off from all I know. From light and life and love and youth, sweet prime. You do well telling me to trust in God, and whom else can any other trust? And yet, my heart is cold. Know you not, mother, sister, know you not. Bernardo even now has gone to implore the judge to grant our pardon. Child, perhaps it shall be granted that we may live to make these woes a tale for distant years. Oh, what a thought! It gushes to my heart like warm blood. And yet both will soon be cold. Oh, trample out that thought. Worse than despair, worse than the bitterness of death is hope. It is the only ill which can find place in a giddy, sharp, and narrow hour tottering beneath us. Oh, plead with famine, with wind-walking pestilence, the blind lightning or the deaf sea, not with man. 
cruel, cold and formal men, righteous in words and deeds of Cain. No, mother, we must die. For such is the reward of innocent lives. Come, obscure death, and wind me in thine all-embracing arms. Like a fond mother, hide me in thy bosom, and rock me to the sleep from which none wake. Oh, that tears, that looks, that hope poured forth in prayer should all be in vain. The ministers of death are waiting round the doors. I thought I saw blood on the face of one. What if it were fancy? Soon the heart's blood of all I love on earth will sprinkle him, and he will wipe it off as if it were only rain. Oh God, oh world, cover me, let, let me be no more. To see that perfect mirror of pure innocence wherein I gazed and grew happy and good, shivered to dust. To see thee, Beatrice, who made all lovely thou didst look upon, the light of life, dead, dark. And thou, mother, whose love was a bond to all our loves, dead, and sweet bond broken. Let me kiss that warm cheek before the crimson leaves are blighted white and cold. Say farewell before death chokes that gentle voice of yours. Let me hear you speak. Farewell, my tender brother. That mild, pitying thoughts lighten for thee thy sorrow's love. One thing more, my child. For thine own sake, stay constant to the love thou bearest us, and the faith that I, though wrapped in a strange cloud of guilt and shame, lived ever holy and unstained. And though ill tongues shall wound me, and our common name be as a mark stamped upon thy innocent brow for men to point out as they pass, do thou forbear. Never think a thought unkind of those who perhaps love you in their graves. Farewell. I cannot say farewell. Oh, Lady Beatrice. Give yourself no unnecessary pain, my dear Lord Cardinal. Brother, tie up my girdle for me. And bind up this hair in any simple knot. Aye, that does well. And yours, I see, is coming down. How often have we done this for one another? Now we shall not do it anymore. My lord, we are quite ready. Well, 